Commentaries, Volume 3, on the Psychological Teachings of Gurdjieff and Uspensky by Morris Nichol. Paper heading, Quermead, Ugly, August 8, 1946. Title of paper, Further Note on Second Body. If a man follows the work and practices it from his understanding and wills it from his understanding, he begins to make a second body in himself. Actually, he is working in other rooms, that is, in the rooms of the third and fourth bodies. To work is to obey. To obey is to will. To act from the work is to remember oneself. To remember oneself is to begin to make something new, i.e. second body. In this paper, I am going to talk simply about second body, although at the same time, this includes the formation of other, of other bodies. If you will this work and what it teaches and do it, you will form something in yourself different from your mechanical psychology. You will form a new body. All this work is so arranged in every detail that if you understand and practice it, and more and more feel its daily presence and try to will it, and so to obey it, you will form a new psychology in yourself, distinct from the multiple chaotic psychology of many eyes that people possess ordinarily and believe mistakenly to be a real I. The difficulty is that people do not see that they have to obey and will this work in their daily life, in daily incidents. People hear this work time and time again and still behave in daily life as though they had never heard what it teaches. Then, for example, they begin to argue as to whether one must become balanced man before one can form second body. The point is simply that if you hear and you understand and you will and so obey this work, you will reach a new stage of yourself. The work will do the rest for you. A man, a woman, must live this work. Now let us try to understand in the simplest possible way what it means to hear, understand, will and so do this work. Take the single point that you have to observe personality in yourself through self-observation. This is connected with the supreme teaching that personality must eventually be made passive in us before all the inner changes possible to man can take place. Your personality at present is in chaos, in disorder. It has no organisation, although through the agency of imaginary I, it pretends to have and deludes you. Your personality is nothing but a mass of acquired contradictory eyes, and each eye at any particular moment can take complete charge of you. At present, a man who simply goes with his changing eyes, that is, an ordinary mechanical man, has, in Gurdjieff's words, no real psychology and is nothing but a machine. If we follow personality and its multiplicity of changing eyes, we are machines, and we live under the hypnotism of imaginary I. That is, we, we imagine that we have a real permanent I. Now, through long self-observation, this false idea of ourselves is gradually done away with. This happens when the work begins to make personality passive. As we are, we are victimised by the most stupid 
and silly little eyes that take charge of us and which we imagine really know what is good and bad. Now, if we hear, understand and begin to obey the work, we shall be gradually shown what is really good and bad. For example, all negative emotions are bad and must be worked against to our utmost capacity in ordinary life. Again, all forms of internal considering, of making accounts against others, are bad and must be worked against. Again, all forms of self-justifying are bad. Again, and supremely, identifying is bad and must be struggled with in every possible way for the rest of our lives. Let us take in the last connection a man who let us take in the last connection a man who has a great deal of self pride. He is of course convinced that he understands what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong, and he acts accordingly, even though it is quite contrary to what the work would teach in him. In this case, he neither hears nor understands nor obeys the work. He will probably only add the idea of the work to his self-pride and use the work in this way. He will feel himself greater than the work, and so his personality will be kept active. In other words, the work will not reach him in his internal depths and start something growing there, namely the growth of his essence or real part. As you know, we are taught that in looking for chief feature, we have to observe what belongs to our self-love and self-pride as one clue. In that case, the only approach to further inner development is through humility, through the real experience constantly renewed that one does not know. In fact, one knows nothing, but is always pretending to know. I often talk to, to you about the feeling of self-merit, the feeling that one is a special case, as it were, different from other people. The feeling of self-complacency, mild or arrogant superiority, and so on. All this arises from self-pride and self-love. A man must, must come eventually to the point in which he, he realises clearly that he is nothing, that he can become something. Then the work takes the place of what he imagined. A man's self-pride can stand in the way of the work acting on him, and in fact it does for many years, and he has, so to speak, fits of tremendous self-pride followed by fits of inner humiliation, and for a long time he does not feel and for a long time he does not feel humility as his most real interest inside and self-pride as his tiresome, artificial side, and so does not catch the many forms of cognition and internal perception that are associated with the momentary absence of self-pride. This is the same as what happens in ordinary life amongst religious people. They profess to believe in God, but internally they do not they believe in themselves. One can profess to believe in this work, but in internally one does not. However, a few eyes may, and then a long struggle has to take place, inevitably, between the eyes that believe in this work, that is, in something higher, and the eyes that do not. 
When a man is in his work eyes, he is quite different from any accidental outer circumstances which may suddenly shift him into his life eyes, which do not believe in the work. That is, they do not believe that there is anything higher than sensual external life. In this sense, a man has to struggle between sense and spirit. All esotericism teaches the same thing, and you will find it on every page in the Gospels. Now remember, there is no reason why you should do this work. Always remember this. Always face yourself with this point. Namely, there is no reason why you should do this work. There is no external proof of it. You can go on with life just as you do go on with it always. No one is asked to do this work. It is simply a matter of your own choice. You are under no vows. But if you begin to hear it, and if what you hear penetrates to a deeper level, and you begin to understand something of it, and begin to try to obey it in your daily life, then the internal thing that holds you to this work will be your understanding. A man can easily go against, against his understanding. But in this case, he will then find himself back in life, just as he was. And if he finds this more satisfactory, he should go back and forget as soon as possible any understanding of this work that he possessed. In fact, he need not forget, because the work will banish from him by itself. In such a case, a man will remain in the same state of his psychology as formerly. He will remain a mass of contradictory eyes that take charge of him and compel him to do things at different times, and to think that I is acting. Such, such a man, of course, will never form a new psychological body in himself. He will live and die in multiplicity of being. He will have no real self-knowledge, and in short, he will have done nothing for himself during his lifetime except serve mechanical life. I wonder if some of you still think you should serve mechanical life as it is now. I ask you, have you faced yourselves with this question? Look at life now. Do you think it leads anywhere? Now let us talk further about the question of chief feature, being in some cases connected with self-pride, which we cannot separate from self-love. Such a man will always want to have his own way. Therefore, he will not be able to obey the work because the work asks him to go against his self-will. It will not be something bigger than he, is, than he is himself. You cannot obey something that you feel is smaller than you. This man will often feel that he is doing what ought to be done, what he thinks is right but he will be having his own way, i.e. he will be acting from his self-love or his self-will. Self-will, self-pride, self-love and self-will cannot be separated. The self-pride is a manifestation of the self-love and the self-will is a manifestation of both. As I have often told you, when some of us were in France, we were told that personality had scarcely any right to exist. The will of personality had to be sacrificed. A person may have objections to this and objections to that, or he may make these requirements, he may make these requirements or those requirements or those requirements before he agrees to anything. All these will be manifestations of the personality under the aspect of self-pride, self-will and self-love. The mechanical acquired personality will direct one's life. The difficulty is that a person, whether man or woman, does not see for a long time that this may be the case. People, 
I notice, either pride themselves on being proud or say that they have no pride. Self-pride is in everyone, but in some the chief feature, the chief feature is very directly connected with it and others only indirectly. Pride is a very latent quality in us all, which is not easy to observe, but it can form a very strong barrier to any further step in development. We justify our pride very easily, but when we begin by inner perception to taste this, to taste this cold, hard, unforgiving quality, we realise how important it is to, to soften it and put ourselves in the position of those we condemn th and put ourselves in the position of those we condemn through it or feel better than. You know the disciples were not accused of vanity. I often think that one of the distinctions between pride and vanity is as, is as follows. Vanity wants to be first, wants to be first, like those two disciples who wanted to sit on the right hand and one on the left hand of Christ in heaven. But pride is rather in what Peter said when he exclaimed, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. But he did. Through fear, he denied Christ. Now suppose you begin to see pride as a personal daily experience through self-observation. Then you see one of these two giants that walk in front of us and decide our lives. If you understand something of the work and you have begun to wish to, uh, to hold onto it so that it may change you in the indescribable and unfathomable way in which it does once you value it enough. Then you will see that you must obey the work and put it higher than yourself by struggling against this pride, against this pride, against the forms in which it expresses itself in your life. Remember, we are now speaking of pride as a source of chief feature. Then you will be hearing, understanding, and obeying the work, and this will begin to make in you a new psychology, a new person, which we can call second body. Do not begin to argue about something that does not concern us at present as to whether such efforts will make second, third, or fourth bodies. Such efforts will make a new body in you a new person, a new psychology, because you will begin to follow, to practice the work itself. The work itself is an organised whole which can create in you a new organism, a second and new person. Remember that the work is not by addition to what you are, but by transformation of what you are. The work is to change you, not to add something as you are, but to change completely what you are now. You cannot, you cannot do this work and remain the same. You cannot add the new wine to the old bottle of yourself. Ask yourself, some of you, have you really changed at all? And do you really wish to change yourself? Or are you full of self-merit? And if you wish to change, what is it you have to change from what you understand of the teaching of the work? Let me remind you of these words. To act from the work is to remember yourself. Then you will will the work against your self-will. Even Christ himself said that he did not do his own will, but the will of him that had sent him. Do you see what esotericism means? The work and all its careful and lovely teachings give you 
an opportunity of willing what it teaches and not acting from self-will. Self-will gets us nowhere, but meditate on what the work teaches and notice whether you ever, you ever have in your life really, sincerely acted from the work. That is, if you have heard, understood and obeyed it at any moment. End of paper. And that's the Psychological Commentaries, Volume 3, and it's pages 9, 3, 4 to 9, 3, 8. I notice over the last few months that a lot of very, very great work is being done uh, by people who are actually sincerely involved in doing the work. And it's, a, it's an arduous, lengthy process. Uh, but if we, as Nichol says in the paper, if we abandon self-will and self-pride and self-love and we obey the work, we actually get uh, glorious results. And I can verify that personally of my journey, my psychological and spiritual journey over the last six months. It's been breathtaking. And the, the small group of people I work with, uh, I see tremendous changes in them. And these changes have come through applying the work totally to oneself and actually, as Nickel says again, actually living the work. It needs to be lived. Uh, talking about it will avail one nothing. The exercises we are given, the things we are asked to do, i.e. self-remembering, uh, non-identifying, etc., etc., <coughs> they, they need to be done. Uh, they need to become, we need to obey them. And as he says, we create a second body. And that second body is a psychological, spiritual body which survives death. Gurdjieff refers to it as the, Kez, refers to it as the Kesjian body. But there's more than one. There's actually, there's, there's four of them, the second, third and fourth body. But as he says, it's no point going into the, the nitty gritty and pulling it apart and so on and arguing uh, whether it's the second, third or fourth body. There is another body, I know this for certain, that actually survives physical death and it is, it is, it is immortal. And I believe through the years I've been doing this work that the reason we are put on this planet is to evolve to a different level of being. And by doing so, we can pull others through the work and through developing one's being out of the morass of mechanical life. And in the fourth way work, as some of you may know, uh, planet Earth is referred to as a pain factory. So all these identifications, all these out of control emotions attached to false personality, uh, fundamentally a feed in the moon and the, the, the pain factory, as I've just said, is planet Earth. And a number of people can actually escape from that through very, very intense work upon themselves. And I saw someone's channel a while ago, and they were putting a lot of uh, stress and praise upon Gurdjieff. What an incredible man Gurdjieff was, how wonderful he was. The work is not about Gurdjieff. He was a channel for it. He was a conduit. Uh, and as Nicole said in the last paper I read for you on self-remembering and the many eyes, uh, the work, it doesn't belong to Gurdjieff, it doesn't belong to Nick, Nicole, it doesn't belong to Uspensky, they're just actually transmitting it. Uh, it's, it's, belong since, it it's been around, I should say, since ba Babylonian and Sumerian times uh, under the, the umbrella term of esotericism and personal development and growth. And I've never been comfortable with this uh, idolizing Gurdjieff and what a wonderful person that he was. He was, he was a, a man uh, who actually transmitted a higher knowledge uh, from a higher level within the, within the solar system, uh, but he was still a man. Uh, and to be aware of that is very, very helpful also. We are using a teaching which has been channeled through someone but which has been here since the beginning of time. Uh, and it's a very, very beautiful teaching. 
Thank you very much for listening. Any questions, comment section, uh, or you can send me an email or whatever. Uh, but the work has, for me personally, has really, really taken off over the last few months. And to see, as I say, it's a gradual, lengthy, arduous process, but something happens. It's like you wake up one day or you're out one day and you think, I wasn't like that before. I used to react and I no longer, re I used to react mechanically, I should say, and I no longer react mechanically. And I have control of, of myself and I can observe myself. And the whole thing, as I said in my last talk, the beginning of the whole thing is self-observation of the many eyes within oneself. This is Noel Troy in his London apartment on a beautiful balmy uh, summer's evening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk, but the nickel commentaries are extraordinary. I've been reading them for about 30 years since I was... 24, 25 or something, uh, and they are a never-ending source of wisdom and enlightenment. Uh, lots of love to you, and thank you for watching. I'll be back on camera very, very soon, uh, giving, a, obviously, a very, very lengthy talk. Bye for now, folks. Thank you, thank you. Bye.